I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and a Senior Fellow here, and we're so pleased to be joined today by Nick Kristoff, columnist at the New York Times since 2001 and a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. He's lived on four continents, reported on six, traveled to more than 140 countries and all 50 states, so he knows what's going on in the world. Um, I wanted to kick us off by asking you about your, a recent trip that you made to Myanmar, because I think it embodies, you bring evidence and data to big global issues, and then you bring it home by connecting it to people's experiences themselves. And you undertook this trip at great personal risk. Two Reuters journalists were actually detained for reporting on Rakhine State in December last year. So tell us, what did you sure. see there? And what does it mean also for the aid partners that have been supporting Myanmar since it opened sort of politically uh, last year? Yeah. Hundreds of millions of dollars going in there. What, what, does it, what, what did you see and what are the implications for the global community? Well, first, I want to thank the center yeah. for, um, <laughs> uh, for um, sifting through all of the applicants for the winter trip journey. And uh, the center has been just a great partner for the winter trip journey. And, um, and I'm, uh, I woke up at 4 a.m. this morning because I'm just back from Central African Republic on the winter trip. <laughs> and, uh, it's, but the, the, truly, the center has been a terrific uh, partner on that. Um, in terms of the Rohingya so, and, and, and Myanmar, um, I've made a few, I think this is my fourth trip and um, the Myanmar government has clearly been, you know, increasingly trying to clamp down on the on coverage of the issue. Um, has been trying to block access, and so we have been able to report aggressively on the issue from Bangladesh, uh, talking to the refugees who cross the border. And I was really. Um, shaken by a trip I made late last year and talking to refugees there. And in particular, one woman uh, who described uh, the, um, all the, the males in her village being executed and the women being uh, let off in small groups to be raped. And as she was being let off to be raped, she had a baby uh, she was holding, trying to hide it under her scarf. And a soldier took the baby by the leg and threw it into a bonfire. And, you know, that's just a, it's, in, it's pretty hard to come back to New York and just move on and forget about it. And, and the real puzzle has been, so we know about the suffering of the Rohingya who fled into Bangladesh and what they went through. It's been less clear the situation of those who remained. And um, so I applied for a journalist visa. Um, not surprisingly, I did not get it. <laughs> um, but as it happened, I'd arranged to be leading a New York Times uh, tour that, and I happened to be leading a chunk of it that ended uh, in Yangon, the Burmese capital. And so it was kind of hard for them to say no to giving me a Myanmar visa when I'm leading, um, I forget how many people, 80 people on this trip there. And so I got a tourist visa uh, with an injunction that I was not allowed to report. Uh, I was careful not to make such a promise myself, but that was the injunction I received. Um, and then um, promptly went off to the Rohingya areas and um, and began reporting. You know, I should say that um, when Myanmar arrested these two Reuters reporters, clearly that was meant as a signal to warn people not to cover this. But um, the real risks are much less to somebody like me and much more to the Myanmar local nationals. I mean, at the end of the day, with a blue passport, I have considerable protection while my local interpreter, my local driver, faced far greater risks. And in fact, the first person I had lined up as an interpreter, um, after a few days, you know, as we discussed what my plans were, uh, going into closed areas, going into villages that were blocked off, he, 
he decided, no, this, this was not a trip he wanted to do. Uh, I, I found another person who was willing uh, to do that, and he in turn found the interpreter. Um, and you know, they were absolutely critical to this kind of reporting, absolutely critical. And they take all of the risks and get none of the credit. Um, what I found is um, you know, that the Myanmar government is systematically trying to make the lives of Rohingya unbearable. Um, in some areas, it's uh, trying to block access to food. Uh, in other areas, uh, it's blocking access to health care. And so um, the, one of the things that, again, just found you know, so, so horrifying, uh, in one village that I visited, uh, a woman had, uh, had had twins a day before she had um, given birth. It was a very, you know, it was her first pregnancy. She's 18 years old. It was a high-risk pregnancy, and uh, she couldn't get access to health care. A midwife, a tr not really a midwife, a traditional birth attendant, uh, delivered them, and both her babies died. And um, her mother and sister had earlier been killed with machetes for being Rohingya. And, you know, she thought, and I think absolutely rightly, that her babies were likewise killed for being Rohingya. That it wasn't, this isn't a natural death when you're denied access to medical care on the basis of your ethnicity. Um, and there's an ongoing debate in the NGO community about whether this constitutes genocide that partly hinges on the question of intent under the 1948 Genocide Convention. I think there's a pretty good case to be made, and you know, we'll, it'll depend on what more evidence surfaces. Um, but uh, when you see this kind of systematic effort to deny health care or food, to make life unbearable, I think it's an effort to drive people away. And it's striking that human traffickers um, managed to, I mean, you know, to get to that village, I took a boat around a police checkpoint. Somehow the human traffickers who were taking Rohingya off to Malaysia or elsewhere, they do manage to, to get through this. The police don't seem to manage to catch them, even though they managed to get the Reuters journalists. And what, what, what does what you found mean for the aid that's going into Myanmar right now? Um, so... Well, first of all, I should say that, um, I mean, a lot of Myanmar is really doing much better than it was before. Uh, if you exclude Rakhine State, then there really has been a lot of progress on the health front, on the nutrition front. Uh, um, but it's, and that's a point that Myanmar officials always make, but it's a little hard to say that, well, aside from the genocide, everything's pretty good. I mean, you, you know, it kind of doesn't work that way. Um, and... Uh, the aid agency, the aid groups are, um, you know, they're there, they want to help. They do get some access to some parts of Rakhine on a kind of very intermittent basis, but it's very intermittent. They're also, um, in effect, uh, silenced because they're at risk of being thrown out. The central government has been orchestrating a campaign to... Uh, demonize them, and that puts them at some risk. It turns the local population against them, um, and so I th basically they can't be effective on the Myanmar side of the border. There, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they, you know, that's maybe a bit of an exaggeration. Sure, they they are indeed saving some lives. They are making a difference in some places, but uh, they are hugely constrained. And you know, in a larger sense, I think one of the things I find frustrating. And sad is that um, you know we all celebrated Myanmar becoming exactly. more democratic, right. and I wonder if that isn't part of the problem, and that one has seen in some places, Sri Lanka, I think, uh, over the last few decades is another where demagogues can use democratic tools to demonize a minority. And, you know, in Myanmar a few years ago, the axis, the political axis, was how much you were for democracy and freedom, whether you were pro-military or pro-democracy. 
that, that axis has changed. And so now it's how much you hate Muslims. And in a democratic system, that's toxic, it's dangerous, and it's very much a part of the problem. And it certainly undermines the efforts of aid groups uh, who are just struggling against enormous odds to, to do more there. Now, there's a piece in the Times today about an uh, effort to uh, clamp down on UN agencies uh, there as well. Boy, I'm just a burst of good news, well, aren't I? Welcome to Monday. <laughs> right. So um, let me ask you about your recent trip to the Central African Republic, now on a uh, somewhat lighter note, with the winner of the winner trip contest. When Central African Republic <laughs> is a lighter note. You know things are going well, right? <laughs> So when a trip really aims to engage young people in development uh, through Nick, we helped him review about 400 entries. And so tell us, what were your impressions about the Central African Republic? How are you feeling about the future of global development more broadly um, based on your, the entries and your experience with the contest over the past couple of years? Um, so... Um, um, a few things. In terms of the, the contest itself, I think one constraint that all of us who care about international development need to think about is that I think it's becoming less cool as a topic. And I think that Trump is sucking the oxygen out of global development issues and making, and I mean, it's true that indeed some of the most consequential decisions in the world are going to be made in Washington over the next few years. And so, indeed, there is some reason to, foc to refocus our attentions to some degree to Washington. But we can't exclude the rest of the world. And, um, but I'm, I'm worried that, that um, you know, there was a period there where, especially for kind of highly educated young people, it was very fashionable to uh, be very concerned with, um, you know, with the, 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 the Central African Republics of the world. And I think that that is fading. Mm. Um, um, and in terms of um, global development, um, so, I mean, I'm, <laughs> you wouldn't know it from what we've talked about so far, but I'm basically a great optimist. <laughs> and, um, you know, I do... Um, I do think we've made unbelievable strides against uh, global poverty, um, against um, uh, child mortality. I mean, it, as you all know, the number of children dying before the age of five has dropped by more than half since 1990. Um, I see it in when I travel and the things that used to just, just shatter me, uh, uh, river blindness, tr blinding trachoma, um, leprosy, you know, these are all so much less common than they uh, used to be. Um, but, and so I'm, I'm sort of reasonably confident that a lot of the world is going to continue to make progress. I think we're, we, we've kind of figured out the toolbox to some degree. But where the, where we're really stuck is in the countries that have a conflict or a post-conflict situation, well, you just can't, don't have access to that toolbox where there isn't anything to do. The, the, the CARs, the South Sudans, to some extent the DRCs, the Northeastern Nigerias. And I'm, and that's one reason why on this trip we went to, to CAR. And I think that in the humanitarian community, we have to think more broadly about what that means for aid. And I think it probably means that that aid has to include not just digging wells and handing out bed nets, but also about peace building and peacekeeping. Um, you can't, you know, the, talk, I talked to one uh, uh, mom uh, in, in Southeastern Car who she'd had five kids, three of them had died. The fourth was gravely ill with malaria. Um, how do you save that child's life? Well, you need a government. I mean, you know, aid groups are great, but it really helps uh, to have a government that stops people from randomly setting up checkpoints. 
um, and people from randomly shooting aid workers. Uh, so I think, um, and you know, the it's not. I think there. I think especially to some degree uh, among liberals, there is a discomfort post Iraq with the idea of uh, of any military intervention ever being kind of humanitarian. Um, and peacekeeping, you know, in some contexts, peacekeepers, those guys in the blue helmets, boy, they are every bit as much the humanitarians as people uh, handing out uh, Plumpy Nut. Um, it's, um, that we take security for granted, but it's like oxygen. The moment you don't have it, boy, you notice it. Yeah, I mean, there's some talk now about cutting foreign aid or using it as a stick for not voting with the U.S., for example, at the U.N. And while it's true that lots of countries are growing very rapidly from an economic standpoint now, there are still these very highly dependent countries, many of them fragile states. Many of the programs work. Some programs don't work. We've had some troubling coverage in the press uh, with some of the biggest NGOs. How should we be talking about aid in this new political reality? Um, so I think that one, one challenge is that um, we tend to focus so much on the problems that we don't acknowledge this backdrop of progress. Mm -hmm. And it's very understandable that people, you know, whether journalists, aid groups, are just so frustrated about the possibilities to save lives. We can just get more resources that we talk about, you know, people die, you know, five million kids dying unnecessarily uh, each year before the age of five. But if we just talk about the failures and the gaps, and I think we leave the public with a sense that global poverty is hopeless. And you see these surveys where 90% of Americans believe that global poverty has worsened or stayed the same over the last few decades. And I mean, that is just crazy. There has been no greater global success in that period than the strides against global poverty. And so I think we, in journalism, mm -hmm. we in the development community have to figure out a better way of framing the issue so that we acknowledge the progress mm. as an impetus for further investments. Um, and I think we need to get better at storytelling. Mm -hmm. And the, there's a, a guy called Paul Slovic who's done a lot of work on you know, what makes people care and so on. And it turns out that I mean, it's largely about, uh, initially about individual stories. It's about an emotional connection, not a rational connection. Um, and it's about a sense that, that there can be better outcomes. And so um, I mean, aid, the whole aid world is very jargon-based. It's very complex. Uh, and it's, um, it's not really framed in ways that make either individuals or members of Congress feel like you know, wow, this is something I want to be really excited about. PEPFAR was an interesting, I mean, PEPFAR was actually something that worked much better in that regard, even though it was named PEPFAR. <laughs> um, you know, there should have been a better way of, a better acronym or something, but, uh, but, um, but I think it's going to be kind of really challenging in that, yeah. you know, given this environment. I mean, do you think that the emphasis on, you know, one of PEPFAR's signature features is its ability to report on progress, right? It counts stuff. It counts people enrolled on treatment. We can argue about whether they should be counting other stuff. But it's really that measurability and that reporting back to Congress that's been so powerful. Do we need similar kinds of approaches elsewhere in the field? You know, I think it's... I mean, I think that the, the numbers are important. I mean, I do think it's also just there is something about what happens when people get ARVs mm -hmm. and they, you know, they go from just being at desk door and being carried in a wheelbarrow to a clinic to yeah. working in their fields or going back to school. I mean, it, it really is just dramatic. Um, in Malawi, one time, uh, I was talking to the undertakers 
and they were complaining about how PEPFAR had ruined their business. <laughs> it's just thrilling. Um, let's put them all out of business, you know? Um, um, the Lazarus it, effect. Yeah, it, it truly sometimes is. Cash transfers are sometimes said to have this, a similar kind of effect. It's, it's not the same as a pill yeah. that raises you from the dead, but it's, it really changes the choices that families made. Have you thought at all about that as uh, there, one of the good news stories that is coming out of the aid business these days? So cash transfers are certainly intuitively easier to understand mm -hmm. than a lot of other things. And that's true of conditional cash transfers as well as unconditional. I'm, I, I, I'm still a little bit of an agnostic on the unconditional ones, while I think the conditional uh, are, you know, clearly mm -hmm. have a... Uh, a, a great evidence base. Um, uh, micro savings is pretty is really pretty under uh, understandable, um, and again has a great record. Some of the um, one of the problems is that some of the things that have the greatest bang for the buck are just unbelievably boring. Uh, <laughs> food fortification, you know, try to I mean salt iodization. I've tried so hard to to find creative ways to write about salt iodization. You can't. <laughs> um, um, vaccination, again, it's hard to think of anything that is just more cost effective. Vaccination is also pretty boring. Vitamin A supplementation, all these yeah. kinds of things. And so, you know, I, I certainly don't think we should move resources from boring, cost-effective areas to glamorous, <laughs> less cost-effective ways. But, um, but I, yeah. I, I do think it's worth also putting more emphasis on the storytelling, on the outcomes. Uh, and I think that will also be more important for aid groups because I think that, um, I think we in the media are going to be dropping the ball a lot more in the next 10 years uncovering these issues. And so that means that they're not going to be, you know, they're basically not going to be covered, I think, and so, unless we figure out new business models for coverage of these issues. And so I think that will make it more important for aid agencies, aid groups, who have people out in the field to figure out ways of taking photos or videos, using social media to try to figure out how to tell that story that I fear we are going to be dropping the ball on. Yeah. What about, can you tell us, what's the one place in the world that no one is paying attention to right now that we should be paying attention to? Oh, um, you know, there, there are many. I'm, I'm glad that Yemen is now, This actually this week is finally getting some a little yeah. more attention. I mean, Yemen is just, it is a disgrace. We are playing the role in Yemen. We in the UK are playing the role in Yemen, somewhat analogous to the role Russia played in Syria. It is a complete disgrace. Mm. Um, and everybody is focusing on the bombing deaths. We don't have any data. I'm sure the deaths from the blockade, from malnutrition-related ailments, hugely dwarf those from, from, from bombs. Um, South Sudan? You know, poor South Sudan, nightmare of bad governance, one in which, again, you know, we, we, we played a certain role in creating that mess. Um, I think it's a lot more Salva Kiir's fault than, than Barack Obama's, but, uh, uh, but we, we have our fingerprints all over South Sudan. Um, climate change, impact of climate change. Oh. Could, we could you go on. You went to the Easter so, Islands. <laughs> Easter I, I recommend Island. <laughs> the Easter Island uh, column. Well, I mean, what you're suggesting, you mentioned security as an important prerequisite to any kind of development intervention. Um, but on the other hand, also, aid agencies aren't so good at institution building, which is really what good governance is about. Have you seen some good examples of institution building? Or, and, and speaking about unsexy topics, I mean, institution building, it, vaccination looks right. amazing in comparison. So um, <laughs> yeah. what, 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 sh what should we be thinking about there? Um, so 
Um, yeah, I mean, institution building, capacity building are, yeah. Um, I feel my own gla eyes glazing over as I say them. Um, but, um, you know, I really do think that at the end of the day, they're important. And there are some groups that do a really good job on this and others that don't. Peace building, I exercises, I think the evidence is more scarce on, but I think there's some suggestive evidence that uh, these grassroots peace building efforts that a number of NGOs have worked on um, are actually promising. And uh, peace, I think the kind of peace building, institution building, that it, it has to happen probably both grassroots up and, and treetops down uh, to be effective. Um, I, uh, I'm, I mean, Paul Collier has done a lot of work on uh, building the economic sinews of a, of a fragile state and what that means in terms of roads and ports and things like this. But of course, that's also, you know, if you're trying to frame things that are not sexy, hmm. like refurbishing a port. <laughs> well, later this week, we'll have President Johnson Sirleaf here from Liberia, and I think Liberia's just had a peaceful transition of power um, from its first post-war president, so hopefully she'll tell us a little bit more about uh, what they've done there. Of course, th there was a, the terrible Ebola outbreak in, in the middle that really set things back, but in some ways, lots to learn from the Liberian experience. Okay, so let me ask you the personal interest one, and then we'll go to the audience for questions. But tell us about something funny, weird, or strange that has happened to you on the job. <laughs> oh, well. This is a suggestion from our media person, so I, I know it must be a good one to ask. Um, well, my, um, my most um, dramatic uh, reporting trip ever uh, was in Congo uh, 21 years ago, and um, it uh, it started with a, a plane crash and uh, flying in from uh, leaving Goma, and um, then uh, that after wasn't all. that's not the whole story. No, something no, happened after that the was plane the, crash. It's that's where it started, okay. <laughs> um, and then. Uh, so I finally got to Kisangani via uh, another route. And then after the plane crash, I kind of thought, hmm, I wonder if there's another way to leave other than a plane. <laughs> and so I looked at the map, and you know, there's this nice road that in theory seems to leave Kisangani <laughs> toward Uganda. And so I asked um, people, and they said, oh, yeah, the, this is 1997, so the middle of Mobutu is, is still, he's, he's kind of gradually falling. Eastern Congo has fallen. Um, and so I, um, I uh, ask um, people, and they say, oh, yeah, the rebels, um, basically Rwanda, had just rebuilt this road so we could send in uh, troops to, uh, to kick out Mobutu. And so I said, great, I'll, I'll hire a, a car and we'll drive out. Sounds perfectly nice and safe. You're not, you know, no traffic accidents. And um, no so... Flying. <laughs> <laughs> so unfortunately, on the first day out of... Uh, Kisangani, um, I run into a, um, a, a Tutsi warlord who was busy uh, killing Hutu, and his um, his child soldiers are all very upfront about this. You know, what are you doing here? Oh, um, you know, we're we're killing Hutu. Well, how many of you? I mean, it was a really remarkable set of interviews. Um, I then sort of made the mistake of asking to speak. Uh, to the warlord. I thought, they're so forthcoming, just wait till I talk to the warlord. And he understood that there's, that it's a really bad idea to tell New York Times reporters about the people you're killing. <laughs> and so um, one of the basic rules of journalism is that you don't lie. You always tell the truth. We're in the truth business. You can't tell falsehoods even to get a better story. There is one exception, that when a warlord is holding you in the Congolese jungle, you lie. And um, so I, seeing this was a very awkward situation, I uh, brought him greetings from his uber warlord. Um, 
uh, uh, Laurent Kabila, uh, Joseph Kabila's father. And now I had not run into Laurent Kabila. He had no idea I was there. But uh, this warlord could not get Kabila on the, um, on the radio. And so after a very anxious um, period, he, uh, he let us go. And then uh, about that evening, he did get Kabila on the radio, who had never heard of us. So he sent a truckload of soldiers after us. So we spent the next four days or five days being chased through eastern Congo by a truckload of soldiers. And in the course of that, I got malaria. And so I've been totally in love with Congo ever since. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I'm not going to, okay. Was that the funny, weird, or strange? All of the above, right? <laughs> Scary. OK, why don't we take a couple of questions from the audience? I'll collect three at a time. Please say your name and where you're from first. Hi, my name is Emily. We're, we're bringing you a, a microphone. Hi, my name is Emily Calgin. I'm from the World Resources Institute. I have been following you on social media since before liking pages was an option, so I'd like to think that once I added you as a friend, we've been friends for a while. <laughs> um, you do have a very powerful voice on social media, and I wanted to hear your thoughts a little bit about in the, I mean, it's been a very, very turbulent time for, try, for organizations who are trying to get their stories across on social media, but at the same time, you have things like the recent movement of the uh, survivors of the Parkland shooting who are making a huge, huge splash and a huge impact using social media as that tool. Thinking a little bit about that, I, um, considering a, a number of other stories that are sort of going unnoticed, for instance, you know, Syria is kind of invisible until once in a while you have a really, really traumatizing picture of a dead child. How do we get, how do we use the power of social media and break through and to be able to make these stories heard? Another question right here in the front row. Thank you. My name is Jeff. Um, I'm a communications consultant for a number of different global development organizations. And um, so I spend a lot of time researching who's going to write about this stuff in the media. And um, you it's are one of the very <laughs> few people uh, for, who's doing that, which is why you, your inbox is probably filled every day. Um, and I. I'm puzzled by that, actually, why particularly American media organizations do not invest more in um, developing and having a stable of reporters around the world who are just covering that. I mean, a lot of people cover it kind of as a side thing. They're global health reporters, for example, and they cover you know, development. But there are very few people who have that beat. Um, it's a little bit better in some of the European press, but not a lot, and I'm surprised because notwithstanding what you just said, there are a lot of dramatic stories and uh, they, they invest a lot of money in uh, conflicts and things blowing up and uh, you know governments being overthrown, but um, not as much in covering global development. So I'm wondering why that is and what can be done <laughs> about it. Okay, one more question over here and then we'll go back to Nick. Thank you. Hi, my name's Ayen, and I work for a radio program called South Sudan in Focus. Um, just first, your book, Half the Sky, uh, has been very influential for me, and it actually played a big part in my decision to study journalism. So I just wanted to thank you and your wife for writing that. More impact. Um, <laughs> uh, my question, though, is about the Central African Republic. Did you do any reporting there? In particular, I'm wondering if you spoke to any South Sudanese refugees, um, and if so, what they said to you. Thank you. Thanks. So why don't we go back to you um, for some... Sure. Um, so um, on the social media front, I think it's going to be more important to use social media channels because for reasons that I'll get to in response to the second question, I don't think we in the media, I mean, I think if you think we in the media have done a lousy job in the last 15 years covering global development issues, I think we're going to do a worse job in the next 15. Uh, and so what... Hmm. You know, what avenues do we have to keep these issues alive? Um, I think social media is part of it. And I, I think that uh, photos, Instagram, I mean, I, I, I wish that NGOs were more um, focused on having their people out in the field, you know, um, you know, pick up their iPhones periodically and take some amazing photo and then 
share it and use the, the organization's resources to try to spread it. And most of the time it'll fail. Most of the time nobody will pay attention. Occasionally, inexplicably, it'll go viral. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, and you know, there's kind of no other, I don't really see any other way. And so I don't think it'll work terribly well, but I think here and there it may be able to, uh, to, to help draw attention to these issues and remind people that there are people out there, that the consequences of our policies you know, will determine whether this kid lives or dies. And it's gonna, it's a kind of a punchy writing of eye for photography that aren't part of this standard um, aid worker skill set maybe, but it's, but there are, you know, there, I'm sure there are amazing people with those skills out there and uh, I think we need to figure out how to do more to, to support them. Um, now the reason I think it's important to focus on the social media side, and, and that's also, by the way, not just Twitter, but I mean also, uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram, uh, uh, is that I'm, I have a kind of a bleak answer to your question. And I think that the reason that we in the media have largely dropped the ball on these issues, and that's particularly true of television, uh, is because uh, the public um, is uninterested in them. There are, you're totally right that there are very interesting stories out there, there are important stories out there, but, you know, I see from my own metrics, we, we get, I can see the exact number of page views I get for stories. This week, going out to Central African Republic, my audience will plunge. And it's not just, you know, I, I always was aware that when I wrote sort of global development stories that, that there would be less reaction. But I guess if you'd asked me when I was just in print, I would have said, okay, maybe it's down 25%. No, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot more depressing than that. Um, the, and I, you know, I can pretty much do a, a Trump column by hitting the F5 key on my keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> and it will get about um, three or four times the number of page views that a piece from Central African Republic or a year ago my trip was Liberia uh, will get. And so from the point of view of a news organization, you can, uh, and TV in particular, I mean, I, I do think that the New York Times and Washington Post, to some degree, the Wall Street Journal, really are committed to these uh, to some degree, but uh, but television has basically stopped covering these issues, and that's because if you're the executive producer of a show, you know you know that you can send a camera crew out to uh, South Sudan uh, or Congo, as it's now sort of DRC is very wobbly, uh, and it'll be expensive and there'll be a certain amount of risk, and your ratings will go way down compared to a rival network that puts a Democrat and a Republican in a studio together and has them yell at each other. And uh, that's, um, that's just so frustrating. And I think that, but, but I, at least for the foreseeable future, I think that's uh, driven by the, you know, the fact that everybody's business model and journalism is collapsing, everybody's more attuned to audience, and these kind of stories don't bring audience. They make audiences run away. Uh, I think that we need to think about new business models, and I think that philanthropy may be, um, may be part of that. Uh, there's a lot of debate about this in, in uh, journalism. Um, and... Um, on the, the third question on uh, South Sudan, uh, first, thank you for reading Half the Sky. I'm glad it had an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that was actually, that's also an example of just how things can be unpredictable. You know, we, we wrote, Cheryl and I wrote Half the Sky thinking that, you know, my mom might read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, our publisher was initially, when we proposed it, was, you know, kind of cautioned us that uh, after our previous books that this one sounded like it had limited you know commercial appeal um, and um, 
And we were sobered by that. We, but we, essentially, we decided, no, this is something we really cared about, and we did. And then, inexplicably, it did get an audience. Uh, actually, Oprah was critical to that. If Oprah had not been around, I, it might well have just uh, died and faded away. Um, in Carr, we did a lot of interviews and reporting. Um, I don't remember any South Sudanese we uh, met there. We were more in the West, and uh, so we, uh, perhaps for that reason, we, we didn't run into uh, South Sudanese there. Okay. Do you have any sense whether in China and Russia there's an audience for global development uh, stories? I mean, in the Chinese media, are they covering these stories better than we are in the U.S.? I don't think so. I mean, the Chinese mm -hmm. coverage of it tends to be, um, I mean, the, the mm -hmm. Chinese press in general yeah. is not exactly a um, banner of uh, straight reporting. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it tends to be um, <clears throat> um, under Xi Jinping's wise leadership, um, you know, Chinese doctors go and volunteer in, uh, in you know, pick your country in, in Malawi. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that people are, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a particular interest there. It is true that Europe, um, I mean, The Guardian, I think, uh, makes a serious effort to cover some of these issues. Um, and, and as I said, that, you know, in the Times, the Wash Post uh, do as well, but uh, I don't, um, but interest, and even within the international, even within the developing world, there's not much interest in what is happening in other parts of the developing world. Uh, so it's not as if there is really a, um, a huge budding audience there potentially for it. Uh, you're, you know, Bangladeshis are not going to be lining up to read about Central African Republic, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. We're all parochial except for Bruno Mars. We're all interested in Bruno <laughs> Mars. Okay. Uh, let's go to the other side of the room. So in the way back. Hi, thanks. I'm Elise, um, Communications for Family Planning 2020. I'm wondering about um, the sustainable development goals. In this kind of very fractured world that you're talking about, where people care less and less about what's going on in different countries. Are global, worldwide things like that, are they still useful? Do you think they're still useful? As like a rallying cry even? The global goals. Yeah. The question of the millennia. Okay, here. Second row. Hello, my name is Iman, and I actually had the privilege of serving as an interpreter in the Moria camp on the island of Lesbos for two months last year. Um, as you were saying, I came back, um, especially as an interpreter, with so many stories of just people wanting to share what was going on, um, managed to take a few photos as well with their permission. Um, but I came back not knowing how to share any of this. You said, oh, I wish aid workers would share their stories, use their NGOs' um, resources. I was working with a very small Dutch NGO. Um, and so that's been a question that I've gotten. Why haven't you shared this? How can you share this? And I was wondering if you could speak more on behalf on what um, people out in the field can do to get the story out there. Okay. And uh, in the far back here, I, I like to make sure people with the microphone get to walk around as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name's Hannah. I'm with the Sabin Vaccine Institute. Um, you mentioned that where we're stuck is where there are places of conflict, where organizations don't have access to the full range of tools, usually. And I'm wondering how you think aid groups could um, take on the task of peace building without losing the benefits of otherwise more apolitical positioning. Um, so, um, um, the, you know, on the, I was originally a skeptic of the Millennium Development Goals, uh, basically because they were complicated, Americans had never heard of them. If I wrote about the MDGs, then I'd have to have a paragraph explaining them, mm -hmm. and that would be a paragraph that would lose me another 25,000 readers. <laughs> and so I tended to, uh, to avoid them, uh, avoid referring to them. Um, 
the SDGs, um, <laughs> they do have, I mean, there is this moniker that people come up with of global goals, which is a little easier um, and saves one word. But then, of course, you still have to explain what they are. And so I'm, in terms of a rally and cry, I'm pretty skeptical. You know, if, I, I do think there's a useful discipline. I think both the MDGs and SDGs that there is really something important about having metrics and having countries compete on the metrics. And I, I do think that's useful at that level. But as a global way of getting people to care about child mortality, uh, or kids in school, I, I'm, I'm kind of unconvinced, I'm afraid. Um, on um, kind of how, you know, what people in the field can do, um, I, um, you know, I think it's uh, just a matter of trying different things and seeing what will spark. Uh, and, you know, we've seen that some individual stories have... Um, have had this incredible effect. And, and they're often ones that make people, frankly, somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, I mean, the, the Coney 2012, I think, made, you know, people in the development community were totally rolling their eyes. Uh, on the other hand, I think it was a real setback to Joseph Coney. And the LRA is, <laughs> uh, was really hurt by the fact that all of a sudden you had all these kids around who were uh, calling on the U.S. to to do more. Three, three U.S. senators called me up in the week after Joseph Coney to say, you know, what is this LRA and <laughs> what do we do? And, uh, and um, so, um, you know, there, there, there is a real tension there about, uh, uh, about this. Likewise, on the protection side, the, the development community has become very, very focused on, on protection issues. And you know, as indeed it should be. And before there were a lot of abuses on protection. But there is a real trade-off there. And obviously you need people's consent. But uh, if you, but if it becomes too bureaucratic and too complicated and too discouraging, then you're not going to have individual stories. And more people will end up raped and murdered. And we have to find the right balance there. And I think that We've overshot on the protection side, and um, that uh, that makes it harder for you know grassroots aid workers in the field to figure out what they can uh, share, and uh, you know do they need a signed release from somebody who may be illiterate, and uh, and you know they're they're complicated questions about where exactly we draw the line, and they're. I'm sure there will be, if we, make, if we reduce the importance of protection, I'm sure there will be some abuses. It's hard to navigate, but, um, but when the overwhelming problem is lack of attention, then I, uh, I, I, I remember years ago in Darfur um, that uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders did a really tremendous um, study of uh, rape in Darfur, but it was all anonymized and about numbers, and it didn't. It was it was very important, but it didn't have any impact because it was general. And you know, I I know the power of an individual story of the uh, you know Alan Kurdi, the little boy who washed up on the Turkish beach. He changed refugee policy in around the world when that photo of him. Uh, and so I, I think we need some uh, recalibration. Um, and in terms of um, advocacy, you know, on things like peace building, um, there are obviously complicated issues about tax status and so on that are way above my pay grade. But I do think that this is a time when global interest is diminishing. Uh, when there are serious efforts in Washington to cut back on, on peacekeeping, when Nikki Haley is boasting in a tweet about how much she is cutting peacekeeping, uh, that it becomes important for those who care about these issues not just to deliver services, but also to change the mood, to advocate. 
and advocacy, I think, uh, is going to be particularly important uh, in the coming years as these, as the spotlight um, goes away from these issues and as people say, well, it's too bad about Syria, but uh, or. Yemen or South Sudan or whatever it may be. It's too bad about that, but we've got, we should fix the problems in our own backyard first. And, you know, a lot of people think that we, and we have to address that. And so whether it's advocacy on particular policies and things that are more political or just advocacy about engaging on these issues, uh, I think, I think it's incumbent on those in the development community to do more than provide services, but also to provide a rationale, provide arguments to, to fill this vacuum. Can I ask you, you know, because of the emphasis of a lot of these organizations on advocacy for a really long time, when there was a problem in some of these organizations, there was kind of a tendency to gloss over it because it might affect their ability to raise funds and or this very fragile real, really presence and profile that they have in the media. What would, what would you advise in terms of, you know, we don't want to create a, a situation where difficulties can't be acknowledged. But at the same time, we want to prevent, present, you know, a good case to the public about why this works, how it works, et cetera. How, how to strike that balance? Because it feels like we're not getting it right in right. the past couple of months. Yeah. Um, I mean, a, a couple of thoughts. I think that... Um, um, I think it's worth acknowledging that telling people is hard. <laughs> it's a lot harder than it looks. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's been out in the field just knows that, you know, it's, boy, it's hard. Um, and I, I think it's okay to acknowledge uh, that, as long as one also acknowledges the, the progress. I mean, as long as this backdrop of progress is shown, then I think it's very healthy to yeah. acknowledge, okay, we tried this and, uh, you know, Clean cook stoves. Um, I'm probably going to offend a thousand people here who are working on clean cook stoves, but However, you know, <laughs> one laptop per child. One laptop per child. Um, yeah. You know, there are so many of these things that we try, and then it just turns out to be a lot harder than we think. And mm -hmm. I, I think we can get away with acknowledging those truths as long as we also note that you know. But meanwhile, we managed to reduce the. You know, the number of people who graduating from extreme poverty since 1990 has averaged 300,000 a day, which is pretty unbelievable. Um, so I think that, um, um, you know, that, that that kind of acknowledgement can be, uh, can be done in a useful way. Yeah, yeah. We'll walk the, the balancing act. Okay, what, can someone tell me what time it is? Okay, great. Nancy in the back. She gets our former, our founding president. Oh, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> wow. So I was really <laughs> bummed out on your response about to Am Amanda's excellent question about institution building. And it made me realize, you know, the analog at the institutional level in the rich world or in the powerful world is the work of the multilateral banks and the IMF. And then I was thinking there was a story in the New York Times over the weekend, I think, about Charles Sanusi, who's now the uh, emir. So it would be great if at some point, you know, maybe once a year, you found <laughs> someone in Africa, for example, at the policy level, who had done something really good at the meta or macro level, the tax reformer, or the, the minister who managed, after many struggles, to deal with corruption in, at some level, and maybe connect it to the work of these other institutions that are not institutions in the developed world, but institutions trying desperately to deal with uh, poor, weak government and sometimes corrupt government in the developing world. And if you want, 
uh, many people in this room could probably send you suggestions <laughs> over the next year. So it would be personal, and it would be around success, and it would be at some meta level around economic or uh, other sorts of policies where I think you are one of the few people who could, maybe by comparing, say, what's happening to tax policy in the US, and what's, how is that relevant or related to, no, how mm -hmm. is that compared to something that's happening around tax policy in Ghana? or Ethiopia? Yes, this is a very personal question yeah. because we at CGD work on policy, so we're not putting yeah. any pills in anyone's mouth. On the other hand, I think we believe that policy is as important a lever for change as that pill that you get to a kid or a vaccine. Yeah, and um, I, I take your point. You know, I must say, though, that the, and the, you know, I, I say this more now knowing, being able to measure exactly how many page views each piece gets, <laughs> that uh, the, you know, the problem, it's not just writing things. It's, I, I mean, I can write about institution building and nobody will read it. And uh, I, after uh, Trump's um, comment about shithole countries, I did a piece about what the US can learn from these so-called shithole countries, what things that they are doing in a really good way uh, that that we can learn from. And some of those were these sort of institutional kinds of steps. And because I figured out a way of tying it to Trump, it became, <laughs> and I'm sure I put Trump in the headline because it's always a way of kind of, you know, come hither. Um, you know, it, it probably brought in more people than it would otherwise, but it still completely flopped as a column. And there, I mean, there's obviously a lot written about institutional, institution building, capacity building, and so on, but it's, um, it's very hard to, uh, to get people to engage. And I, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm not saying I would give up, uh, but it, this is a huge impediment. And there are a lot of, it's part of this fabric of really important things that, um, that it's hard to put human face on, that it's hard to engage with. Trade, I think, is one of the most important ways to, to, to fight poverty. I'm a huge, you know, AGOA, I think, is one of the most important policies we have, and yet try to, you know, try to write a, a piece about AGOA. Um, um, and so um, that's why I'm, you know, over time coming to think indeed that, uh, that the philanthropic models uh, for, um, uh, for covering some of these issues may be, may have, more merit. Uh, the, there was an interesting experiment with the, the Gates Foundation, which I think actually was not totally promising, but it, what happened was uh, a few years ago, um, the Gates Foundation uh, essentially decided to bribe CBS News to cover uh, global, well, well, it was called a grant, but <laughs> <laughs> same idea. And they, um, they, so it was a year-long grant, I forget the amount, but they, so CBS covered, um, they did some great stuff on maternal mortality, on micronutrients, um, a few other things. It was just tremendous journalism. Um, and so this has been controversial within the development community, so why should the Gates Foundation be spending money on overpaid television executives rather than on vaccines? Uh, but, um, uh, but they, they really did great stuff, and this elevated those issues on the global agenda. So after a year, the Gates Foundation went back to CBS News and said, we'd like to renew the grant. And ABC said, nope, we don't want to take your money, because when we run these important pieces of great journalism, uh, viewers switch the channel. And, you know, as a journalist who cares about these, I find that incredibly challenging and dispiriting. And, you know... Part of the answer is we got to figure out better ways of telling those stories. Uh, policy, and you know, we also screw up in writing about domestic policy. It's not just policy abroad. It's, if you think about our coverage about uh, domestic um, anti-poverty policy, opioid policy, all kinds of things. We, you know, we're, in general, we're, you know, 
policy is not is not our uh, our forte. Um, but but those you know that challenge in the existing business model is really just a huge burden. Okay. Three more questions now in the middle. So let's go with this woman in the green PVs. In the middle row. Yeah. And then we'll go to the person next. Hi, my name is Paula Donovan. Um, thank you for this. It's actually amazing. And I'd like to congratulate uh, CGD. This is my first time to be at something that you've done. I spent uh, almost 30 years at the World Bank um, on the macro side. And for a second career, I retrained as a psychotherapist. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm listening to, to how you're speaking, and uh, especially, in fact, your, one of your most recent comments. And I'm bridging between my previous career, long-term focus, um, results-oriented, and my subsequent career as a psychotherapist. And I'm intuiting the psychology in the room at the moment. So bringing to bear my second career on my first, uh, the first thing I'd like to say is, well done, everybody in the room. Because I think when I was in development work, we would have the annual meetings, we would have a lot of fora. It was a very channeled leadership situation. We were premier development organization, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of ego stoking and self-care associated with all of that, which frankly keeps you going. And you're surrounded by hundreds of peers every day of the week. Today, as you rightly say, the development challenge has become much more granular. Probably a lot of people in the room are on their own paycheck, if they can find it. They're scrambling for consultancies, etc. This is, I'm speaking as a psychologist now, this is enormously draining. It's enormously challenging and it's very lonely. So to me, in my second career, it reminds me of our work in addiction treatment. Because addiction treatment is long term, results are frequently poor, there's a lot of relapse, it's not sexy, nobody wants to see it on the television, usually, so occasionally. Success stories become failures, all of that stuff. And my conclusion from looking at the two careers is that the greatest asset we all have is peers. We've got analysis to help us along, so we all have done our training and all that. And then we have peers. And our peers are the people who help us keep the faith to keep going. And then we have our inner wisdom, which is about our self-care and how we take care of ourselves and all that. So I'm not going to give a psychology lecture here. <laughs> but it's just to say, as you rightly said, this is hard. And so when I heard the young man speak about his Instagram photos when you were in Lesbos, well done you. Um, my question is, if everybody in the room we treated or retweeted or <laughs> re-Instagrammed or forwarded what we ourselves do. If, if we each become the resources for supporting each other's work, if we try to put a frame of abundance rather than a frame of competitiveness, I know this sounds a little Pollyanna, but on the other hand, everyone in the room is a kind of an endangered species. And when you're like that, you kind of need to ask yourself, how do we maximize the ripples and the energy. So uh, I hope there's something <laughs> hopeful in this because I think this area needs hope. It, you know, that's why people switch off the channel. They, they, they're going to their TV for recreation. They're not going for a downer. And so that's what we have to be for each other. And I'd like to just toast uh, CGD because obviously that's what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you pass the microphone just right in front of you? Thank you. My name's Roberta Baskin, and I'm a recovering journalist. <laughs> and I'm um, actually very interested in the SDGs now and doing the opposite of what I did, which was doing corporate misconduct stories all my life, and now looking for companies that are doing good things in the world. I was also very moved by Half the Sky, and, and think of it as a collection of stories about resilience, about what people are doing, I mean, getting to um, aching problems in the world, but through characters who are doing amazing work. And in fact, I had a book party mm -hmm. where 25 people showed up in, in Snowmageddon in DC to talk about it, and we're excited about it. When I um, read your column at the end of the year where you did um, celebrate the good things in the world, and you're closely following these metrics now, in my heart, 
I believe that a lot of the stories that I did over the years left people with despair. And the idea of, um, of doing stories in a thoughtful storytelling way, not about policy, but about people, but getting to the policy that way, um, that, that leaves people with hope now more than ever. I mean, so many people are tuned out of the news. They want something to hang on to about what's right in the world. And you can still expose the problems, as you did in Half the Sky, and as you did in your end of year column. Um, and I wonder how that column did in terms of metrics. Okay, thank you. One more here in the front. Ava Hamas, um, two questions. One is, you talk about measuring how many people read your column, but like I read it in the print version. Do I even count? Because um, how do you know that I've read it? Um, and the other thing is, um, which relates to the previous two questions, is I wonder if you could talk about how you keep up your sense of optimism, because I think there's a reason the Hallmark Channel has gone up, and I think people are in such despair about not just Trump world, but you know the move to the right in, in so much of Europe, for example. And how do you manage to get through that, and what words of wisdom do you have for us? Thank you. Um, so, a bunch of really interesting questions. Um, on the question about peers and so on, you know, I, I think there's a lot to that and that, I mean, one of the classic problems is uh, warring saints, you know, where you have all these wonderful people doing good things and they're all saying how awful the other NGOs are and, and it's, um, um, as a journalist, it's so frustrating. You want to bash these saints over your head with a two by four. Um, um, I also think that one of the problems is that the development community has been, uh, frankly, too homogeneous and that it needs to draw uh, on a broader base. And in particular, one of the un un undertapped resources uh, is the evangelical Christian uh, community. And Obviously, in the area of reproductive health, there are going to be plenty of areas where there, you know, people are glaring at each other and, and so on. But if you want to make progress, you've got to have a broad constituency. And when you've got um, you know, more than a quarter of Americans are in the evangelical, Pentecostal, born again community, uh, they are potential allies. PEPFAR happened because of them. Uh, President's Malaria Initiative arguably happened in large part because of them. And so I think that um, we've got to figure out more ways of building bridges uh, with that constituency in particular and bleeding heart liberals working with bleeding heart conservatives uh, and, um, you know, and extending that and, and you know, acknowledging that there are going to be plenty of areas. Reproductive health is probably the most important where it's going to be really hard and, and it's not going to work there. Um, the, um, um, on Half the Sky and um, Hope, you, um, you, you kind of ferreted out the, <laughs> our, our, our methodology that um, we, I, I was really shaped by the work of Paul Slovic, who I mentioned earlier, and what makes us connect. And it really, came because earlier I just found it so dispiriting to be writing these pieces about things that felt so important and just have them kind of disappear without a ripple. And so, um, I mean, Paul Slovic's research had emphasized that kind of what two things really matter to make people care. One is individual stories with an emotional pull, and the other is showing that there can be better outcomes, that there can be progress, that it can be hopeful. And so, indeed, if you look at the anecdotes we tell on Half the Sky and later in A Path Appears, uh, then it's very much, you know, stories that plumb depths of awfulness that are almost unfathomable. But then, lo and behold, the person recovers and triumphs and with some, you know, with some support shows that there can be dramatically different outcomes as a way to, you know, we, we wanted to write an uplifting book about sex trafficking and gender oppression and so on. And there, I do think that that measure of uplift is really totally important. And indeed, the, the column you mentioned at the end of the year is saying that the world is so much better than you think. That did do pretty well. Um, and uh, so that's, um, you know, I do think that 
um, there's an important message there. And, and, it's, and conversely, one of the things that I worry about as a reporter, uh, which is not exactly the same as sort of parallel, but I worry that I, you know, the, 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 the parts of Africa that I cover are South Sudan, DRC, SCAR. It's really, it's all the, the places that are just falling apart. And I do worry that this inadvertently sends a signal that Africa as a whole is all screwed up in ways that may discourage investment, discourage tourism, create the sense of, of hopelessness. And so, you know, periodically I frantically paddle back and say, oh, but, you know, seven of the ten fastest growing countries in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa, or, you know, things, things along those lines. And, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge. And in the media world, as you know, we, you know, we cover planes that crash, not planes that take off. And in the aviation world, we sort of understand that there are a lot of planes taking off that people are unaware of. And in the context of global development, we tend to be oblivious to those planes that are successfully taking off. So that, too, you know, I, I think your bottom line about needing more hope and uplift is absolutely right. Absolutely. And uh, I, I, I do uh, try to do that. Uh, CAR will be a bit of a challenge to provide that uplift, but I will do what I can. Um, the um... Hallmark Channel. Oh, yeah. Uh, Should there oh, be a Hallmark and, movie um, based in car? And, um, 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 you, you're, you know, and, and by the way, you're right that print readers don't count. I mean, the only metrics we have are, are, the, uh, are the online uh, harsh, readers. Harsh. Um, and, um, but I, I do, um, I think that, you know, the notion of injecting more optimism, you know, Sort of one of the problems is journalists. So we're covering the planes that crash, and meanwhile, aid groups are trying desperately to get more money, and so they're talking about all the unmet needs and all the problems. And so there tends to be an accent on all the terrible things that are happening. And I, I think you're right that we need to, to rejigger that. Okay. Do we have time for one more round, Sarah? Yes. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Why are you so peppy? So, um, <laughs> um, you know, two two things. Um, and it, yeah, people always. It's sort of funny because people who read my columns, they they are always a little sensitive around me. They think I must have PTSD and you know be this sort of Eeyore of journalists. And I'm I'm basically a pretty optimistic uh, person. And I think two things. I mean, one is that in my reporting career, I have seen unbelievable progress. Just staggering progress. I mean, you know, my 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 first trip in Sub-Saharan Africa was as a law student escaping and backpacking through uh, West Africa, and the blindness that I saw. So many people being led around, middle-aged people being led around by their kids or their grandkids because they were blind from cataracts or from river blindness or or blinding trachoma. You know, blinding trachoma. It's hard to think of a worst way to go blind, incredibly painful. And um, that can be, uh, you know, zithromycin administered three years in a row for, you know, pennies uh, per person, gets rid of it. Um, And uh, Jimmy Carter's work on river blindness, staggering, all because fortunately, I know you you may know the story, the um, uh, ivermectin, the drug, is it's used for dogs in the, in the U.S. and Canada. And uh, so uh, there are all these assembly lines churning out ivermectin for dogs, and fortunately overpriced for dogs, which then leads Merck to donate huge amounts of it to, um, to West Africa. And so we have our pets to thank for uh, incredible success against river blindness. Um, and the other thing that I'd say is a source of optimism, other than just seeing that pro- progress, is that Side by side, and I think any of you who've done this kind of you know, work in the field will see this, that side by side with the worst of humanity, you really do see the best. You really do. And so um, I, I, I remember one trip to Eastern Congo, and I uh, spent time with a warlord who was busy murdering people, raping people, um, really emblematic of, of evil. You know, and evil feels like one of those Old Testament words, 
You go to Eastern Congo, you see evil. Um, but the person who left an even deeper impression on me was this incredible Polish nun. In the late 70s, she'd been in Congo for 30 years, um, and uh, she was single-handedly, other NGOs had fled, she was, she'd stayed behind, she was single-handedly single running an emergency feeding center, um, an orphanage, uh, negotiating to, with the warlord to keep him out of, out of her town, Rutsuru. And um, it, she underscored this human capacity for courage, decency, magnanimity, compassion. We're not tested to the same degree here, but when people are tested in places like that, they sometimes come through with just flying colors. And so I managed to come back from Eastern Congo feeling better about, about human nature. Uh, and I came back and I just wanted to become a, a Polish nun. <laughs> Um, so that's how I feel optimistic. Okay, let's, uh, how much time? Okay, so we'll do Ed here in the front row and then this lady here. And then you can bring us home. Hi, Nick. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, one of the things that I find really strange and almost no attention seems to be given to it is enlisting the other rich countries in all this stuff. Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Saudi Arabia. These are all people, India. These are all people who have lots of money. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, while, and China, for sure. Uh, and yet, the extent to which they are proportionally engaged in trying to make the rest of the world a better place is almost nothing. And nobody seems to, everyone gives them a pass. And I don't know, well, number one, they shouldn't get a pass. And number two, what can we do about it? Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Stephanie Bowen. I'm with White Ribbon Alliance. And I've been listening to a lot of what you've been saying about the media. Uh, I spent 15 years as a journalist before my career in global health and development. And I am very curious about this idea of the, the media not really picking up on stories here. White Ribbon Alliance, we get a ton of media coverage in countries where we work. Uh, our model very much engages the media and brings to uh, the forefront issues that are that are happening there as we build government relationships with citizens. Do you think we should, we as a development community, should start focusing on um, media, our traditional media outreach in the countries where we're working? And then are there ways to really leverage that coverage that we get with higher profile media outlets here that are important for our growth and uh, you know our work in in this area. Okay, two good questions to conclude. Two great questions. Um, on Ed's point about uh, you know other countries, I I completely agree with you that there's uh, uh, you know that that we should be applying more pressure. Um, um, I must say that I do think that uh, we. That in the I mean, there's something of a competition in Africa with China, and I think we um, the, the the ill that China uh, does in Africa, which is considerable, gets a lot of attention. China actually does do an awful lot in terms of providing scholarships and and uh, and other programs uh, in in Africa um, that I think we tend not to uh, pay attention to. I I wish we could. Um, I mean one. One of the challenges is that it's, um, it's again, hard to figure out an engaging way of, call, of getting other countries to, to do this. And every time I write a Rohingya uh, piece, I, uh, I include uh, in my first draft a, a sentence or two about how India, it would be so helpful if India applied some pressure on Burma. And then I, as I edit my own piece and I look for things that are going to lose readers, I end up taking that paragraph out because it's, uh, it's, um, it's the kind of thing that just loses American readers. So I, to I agree with you. I wish we could create more of a kind of a healthy competition 
Uh, and for a while in the Clinton administration, we kind of had that. Uh, we lost it. The, I mean, the European um, EBA, everything but um, aid, is that what it's called? Um, you know, my, I mean, my sense of it is that it's a, um, it's a sort of program that pretends to be a trade initiative that purports to help poor countries, and in fact, is carefully structured that so no poor country can ever take advantage of it. Um, and it'd be nice to do some naming and shaming, uh, but again, it's it's really hard to figure out how to uh, engage, how to how to how to write about this uh, uh, um, in a in a powerful way. Um, on um, um, I can't read my own note. <laughs> no, it's the uh, the White Ribbon Alliance question. Uh, media partnerships with oh, local journalists. Yeah. And so it's completely true that um, you know the local journalists are engaged, are interested in some of these issues uh, in a way that the that our world isn't. And I think that that's um, I think that's important to pursue. Um, uh, I mean, you you know you look at. India and attitudes towards sexual violence and gender-based violence. It used to be that there was 100% impunity for people engaging in such behavior. So India, the India media began to write about these cases and impunity has dropped to 70% or 60%, but there's been real progress. And when people, when the middle class in these countries begin to be aware of the scale of the problems, that really matters. Um, and so maternal mortality, your, your world, you know, if um, uh, when people in developing countries become aware of, uh, of how many women uh, die completely unnecessarily, uh, then that matters. Uh, cervical cancer, it is a disgrace that a quarter million women around the world will die this year of cervical cancer completely needlessly. Um, you know, maternal mortality is, that's complicated to fix. That's hard. There, it's, it's expensive. Uh, we've got to do a better job. But it's, that's, the low-hanging fruit in reproductive health is saving lives from cervical cancer. And I think that uh, there, that we can do, uh, you know, that's really important to have countries write about this, broadcast it. Uh, uh, this kind of thing. Um, so, I, uh, I, I I really welcome that. I think what's harder is to then leverage that coverage to coverage in Western countries. Um, and at the end of the day, we need to have not just the Indian media, but also the Western media write about these issues. We are the donors. We're the ones who have crazy. I mean, one reason why women die of cervical cancer in developed countries is because local health ministries don't uh, do HPV vaccinations and don't do the vinegar test, things like this. Another reason is because we have the, the global gag rule and because we defund the UNFPA. Uh, and so we also have to cover these issues in, in our countries. And that's, um, that's, I think, the... Big challenge, and um, I, uh, I would just say that that's got to be a shared effort, and uh, I will do what I can, and you will have your own spotlights in your social media accounts and your institutions, and it's going to be an uphill struggle, but uh, together I hope we can keep a, keep a light, a spotlight on these issues, and certainly the center global development does that. Because if these issues are not illuminated, they just won't get addressed. Thank you so much, Nick. Thanks. Thank you. you.